maybe it's part part of it could just be like hey that's what my mom and dad did and like it's just good. like sometimes that often happens right there's like tradition in it um does that lead to like many thefts and things like that because obviously i can imagine if, if people are drawing their salaries it's like just hang out there then put like just pull out a gun and rub someone as they walk away from the cash machine like i know that was a big part of in el salvador um a part of the whole bitcoin thing was like well actually like i don't have to go to the cash machine to go get my money i can just kind of use it on my phone and not have to worry about it as much kind of thing and puts me less at risk uh, is that like a thing in south africa like people robbing people at the atm yeah it's it, it's a it's a big it's a big thing there's um i think it's um when 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 people when people see um youtube clips or whatever of, of cash and transit robberies in south africa um it's it's strange but it, it does actually happen they they are they are organized gangs who who target these vehicles that literally drive around with piles of cash um it's 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 got a i mean obviously south africa like like i mentioned has got a very well developed banking sector so there are cash machines all over the place but these things have to be serviced with physical paper currency and so it is quite a common thing. Um, cash in transit heists is, is a real thing um, in, in the country. Um, I think just to your point earlier, I, I know that another one of the reasons why people mistrust the banking system, and I'm not sure why this is, but banking is, is particularly expensive in South Africa. So banking fees are, um, I, was, I, I was very surprised when I was working in the UK to find out that I can actually have a bank account that doesn't cost me anything. Um, I've got a I've got a bank card that allows me to get cash from the ATM. I've got the, the account and, and none of it is costing me anything. I only pay fees if I withdraw cash from a, from a competing bank or whatever. Whereas in South Africa, you pay for every single transaction. You pay for every withdrawal. You pay for, you pay for every deposit. Every time you deposit money into the bank, you pay. You pay for sending money between your own bank account and somebody else's bank account every single time you do that. It's a, it's the, the fees are very high, so that could be one of the reasons why people don't actually. I, I know it's one of the reasons why a lot of merchants don't actually accept electronic payments, um, and why they insist on working in cash only because they, they don't actually want to lose out on the fees. That makes a ton of sense. Yeah, absolutely. Because yeah, in the UK. I think they used to have, I mean, these days, honestly, every cash machine of every bank, it's free. Like I, I'm, I'm with certain bank, I can go to any of the banks. You get the odd one in like petrol stations or everywhere, you get charged a one pound fee, but, but otherwise it's free for everything. So yeah, I can understand then a lot more. Yeah, why, especially why Bitcoin's more attractive too, when people understand it, because it's like, well, Lightning Network fee is <laughs> like nearly nothing. So it makes a lot more sense. What, like, what role do the surfer kids play in this? Because I've seen videos of the surfer kids using bit refill to make uh, uh, phone top ups and, and buy other stuff. And then I've also seen um, videos of, of the surfer kids, I think it was going to like convenience stores and purchasing stuff with lightning uh, directly from the merchant. Uh, uh, yeah, so the surfer kids, the, the surfer kids, um, it's probably a good idea to clarify that. But the Surfer Kids is the nonprofit that we started in 2010. Um, so my wife and I have been operating uh, that that NPO uh, since then. And basically, since then, the Surfer Kids mission has been really simple. Uh, we go into these really poor communities and we recruit the kids and we try and teach them surfing as a way to just you know learn learn some life lessons about commitment and and the value of long term commitment and achieving your goals. Um, and so what Bitcoin Ekasi does, Bitcoin Ekasi basically just pays the salaries of the coaches who work for the surfer kids. So those coaches are still doing, for the most part, they, they're doing the same job that they did before, which is they teach kids how to surf. Um, but then we, only, we could only afford to employ one coach. Uh, when we were still operating on a fiat standard. So the Surfer Kids was basically operating with a single coach, a single uh, senior coach. Um, and we had some junior coaches helping, but none of them were earning anything. Um, when we started Bitcoin Ekasi, we started supplementing the senior coach's salary with Bitcoin. And we started actually paying the junior coaches for the first time with Bitcoin. And so they are still working for the Surfer Kids and they are still doing what they did before, which is, teaching the kids from the township how to surf um, but they're earning their salary in bitcoin with the idea 
of spending it at the shops um, that we've onboarded um, to accept Bitcoin as payment. So Bitcoin, Bitcoin Ekasi is basically just an extension of the Surfer Kids. The Surfer Kids is the, the NPO that provides the structure for us to be able to do what we do. Um, obviously, we want to get Bitcoin in the, into the community, but we want to do it in a way that's responsible. So we don't just want to hand it out to people. We want to give it to people who have actually worked for it and who have earned it. Um, and so those are the coaches. They, if they've worked for it, they've earned it. And that's basically their salary. Really cool. I mean, how many, how many stores or places accept Bitcoin in the local area? Would you say like off the top, like off the top of your head kind of thing, not, not super accurate. Um, well, I mean, I, it, it's, I, I could tell you pretty accurate. It's not a big number. It's only six. Um, so it's, uh, but it is, it, it's a pretty small, it's a pretty small community. Um, and there's probably about a total of somewhere between 25 and 35 merchants um, that we could onboard uh, if we onboarded every single merchant in that community. So it's, it's, been, it's been six for about two months now. I think the last time we onboarded a new shop was two months ago. Uh, five of them are sort of little small grocery stores where you can buy your regular milk and sugar and, and, and staples. Uh, and then one of them is a barber shop uh, where the coaches go and get their hair cut. Um, so we are taking it really slow, but we're not, we're not focused on onboarding as many shops as quickly as possible because there's, there would be little point in us onboarding an, an extra five shops if nobody is spending Bitcoin at those shops. And so at the same time as onboarding shops, we've actually got to make sure that we get Bitcoin into the hands of somebody who's going to go and spend it there. So if we're going to onboard another shop, we, we would probably look at employing an extra person so that there's an extra person spending Bitcoin at that shop that we just onboarded. Um, it's, not the, it's, it's not the kind of area that, I mean, the, yeah, the area we operate in is really, really poor. Uh, people live in, in makeshift structures that's basically built from scrap material. Um, a lot of the places don't have running water, no flush toilets. Um, electricity is kind of they 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 sort of you know relay elect electric cables from one place to another completely illegally very dangerous so that's that's the kind of neighborhood we're, we're operating in and it's it's not the kind of place that anybody is going to go into from the outside unless they have a very specific reason for being there which is probably that they live there so we can't we can't onboard shops and then hope that people from the outside are going to come and spend Bitcoin. That's just, that's just not going to happen. It's not, it's not that kind of area. So it's, it's a small number of shops because we've only, we've, well, we're paying about six salaries at the moment. So six salaries, six merchants, it, it sort of evens out. If we add one or two extra people working for Bitcoin, we'd probably add one or two extra shops accepting it, accepting it. What, what is the total population of the people living in that area? Because from what I gather from what you're saying is that um, the goal is to, you know, put people, like you said, responsibly, put, you know, Bitcoin into the hands of as many people as possible responsibly. And, and doing that, they have to earn it. So I guess, you know, your way of, you know, having to distribute Bitcoin is to employ, you know, as many people. So I'm, you know, I'm thinking, what is the population of the people in the area you know, that would be enough to sustain that circular economy that, you know, you're, which you're talking about. So we are, we are based in a, in a small town. Um, the town is called Mossel Bay. Uh, it's, it's not, it's not big enough to be called a city. Um, the population of, of Mossel Bay is probably about a hundred thousand people. So it's, it's a big town in South African terms, but I guess depending on where you're from, that could be a small town. Um, and then the community that we're based in is a township that is just outside the economic center of this town. And the, the township community is probably around, I'd say, between five and 10,000 people um, at most. Um, and that's, that's, that's kind of the area we focused on because historically, that's where we've always uh, recruited the children who participate in the Surfer Kids program. Um, and we've always focused on that particular area as a base for recruitment. 
um, because it's walking distance from the beach where we coach the kids how to surf. So it's that access between the township and the beach that that we've been relying on. And so we focused on the same community. Um, I'd say if we could, if, if we could probably, I mean, we could realistically employ probably about another four or five people um, without drastically changing the, the structure of, of what we do and the way in which we do it. Um, obviously, you know, the organization can grow bigger than that. Um, but if we employ about another four or five people, we'd probably reach our current sort of structural limit. Um, and then, then hopefully the aim is to, you know, to start circularizing the economy so that the people who are receiving Bitcoin also go out and spend it. And then those people go out and spend that and they go out. So one of like, just as a little small example, one, one of the shop owners that have been accepting Bitcoin from us since last year, August, um, has actually started using it now for her day to day. So she, she, she got a haircut from the barber that we onboarded. So there's an exchange between two people using Bitcoin and neither one of them are directly related to us. Um, they just accepting Bitcoin from our coaches. I mean, I don't, I don't know at what point does this become a circular thing? Um, I, I don't know what the numbers need to be for that to happen. Um, but I guess there's a certain threshold and as long as you're below that threshold, it's always going to be this little thing that you have to keep powering. And if you stop, then the whole thing falls flat. And then if you go above that threshold, then maybe it starts powering itself. I, I don't know. I don't know, but are there plans to establish, you know, similar, you know, um, projects like the one you have, you're doing currently in other parts of South Africa, you know, with similar problems of, in, you know, wealth in this, where they have wealth, serious wealth gap. And you know when you know poverty is rife in you know areas, so that because um, from what I, from what I understood, what Bitcoin Beach is doing basically is establishing a circle economy in a place where you know tourists would come and and as far as I can tell, the place is thriving. Do you do you plan to establish similar things in different locations within South Africa? Um, I'm not sure if we'll move to different places. Um, we'll probably focus on the community where we're at at the moment until we've got that entire community. Um, onto a Bitcoin standard, if that's even possible. Um, I would like to see the idea being copied by other people um, to implement similar things in other parts of the country. That that would be really cool. Um, you know, it's, it's one of the reasons I, I, I think, one probably one of the main reasons I started it's because I thought that it would be a great example for people to, to see how this thing can be applied in real life. Um, in a way that's relatively simple. I mean, it's, you know, we didn't, we didn't reinvent the wheel or anything. We just, you know, basically just instead of paying people in fiat, we started paying them in Bitcoin and we, you know, convinced a few shops to accept it as payment. And, and hopefully, hopefully that model sort of spreads to other parts of the country. Um, but for our purposes, I mean, I would like to see it spread a little bit wider than just the little community we focused on. Um, tourism is quite a big interest industry in this part of the country. So I think there is room for, for what happened in El Salvador to be repeated here. Um, but I, I can't see us growing beyond our community for the time being. Um, a question I had is what wallet are, are you guys using to, to onboard people? Um, what lightning wallet are you guys using? Yeah, I've, I've never been super technical. So every, everything we've done has always been sort of um, plug and play. Uh, whatever, whatever we can find on the, on, the, on, on the Google Play Store is what we've used to, to run our project. So we, we're, using, we're using quite a few different wallets. Um, we, started off, we started off with Moon Wallet. Uh, we found that a little bit impractical because the merchants had to issue invoices. And so we started looking for a wallet where they could have a static uh, Allen URL code. Um, but we, we, we were quite limited in our options because we also had to have con conversion rates within the wallet to local currency. So obviously we couldn't, we couldn't expect merchants to do conversions between dollar and rand. Um, so a lot of the wallets wasn't actually, couldn't actually convert into local currency. So eventually, 
we were using a combination of Lightning Tipbot, Blue Wallet, and now more recently Wallet of Satoshi. Um, Wallet of Satoshi very recently added uh, static LN URL um, um, codes to their Lightning wallets. Um, so yeah, Wallet of Satoshi, Lightning Tipbot, which is based on Telegram, um, Blue Wallet, Moon, um, those are the ones that that we've we've used and are still using. Maybe I mean I don't have the ability to to take the Galloway software and fork it into a a Bitcoin Ekasi wallet. I know there are other projects that have done that. Bitcoin Jungle, Bitcoin I think Bitcoin Lake has also done that now. Um, that'd be great, um, but for the time being. You know, we're basically using stuff we download off the Google Play Store, pretty much. Do you think you can help with that? Get in touch. That's, yeah. uh, that sounds like the, the answer to that one. I mean, I, I don't think I'm quite good enough to do that myself either. But um, yeah, if anyone out there has experience with forking wallets or yeah, or even the guys at uh, Galloway, have you spoken to the guys at Galloway about that at all or not really? Like, is that the sort of conversation you've had? We have, we have spoken about it. I think... I think, I think the, the biggest challenge is actually um, hosting the back end. Um, so using using the software itself or forking the software itself and um, changing a few bits and pieces to to suit our purposes wouldn't be wouldn't be such a big headache. But I think you know hosting the back end and the servers for that that's you know obviously something that 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 costs cost money um so we haven't we haven't we have had some conversations but but not many there are some people that have shown interest in in helping with that um but i mean i think it'll happen at at the right time um when when the time is right somebody will come forward and say hey look i want to help with that and um yeah i mean as long as we keep doing what we're doing eventually the right person will will put their hand up um so yeah, I'm not not too not too rushed about that. I think what we are using at the moment works fine as long as it's a relatively small project. You know, if we're going to try and onboard a hundred shops, then it's going to be difficult to do it in the way that we're doing it at the moment. Um, but with it only being six stores and and six coaches, it it works all right uh, for the time being. One one of the like most important things that kind of helped get Bitcoin Beach off the ground in El Salvador was uh, Jorge and Roman and others like going out and talking to the people and having like an educational outreach. Are you guys doing any sort of uh, Bitcoin education? Uh, yeah, hundred um, percent. So I mean, I I basically just just run the admin side of things. Um, I do the social media um, and I do most of the communication, um, you know, stuff like this, the podcast and so on. But that's only because I've got a bit of a history with Bitcoin. Um, but the, the, the work on the ground is being done by, by our coaches. So when they're, not, when they're not coaching the kids to surf, they'd actually be up in the township um, communicating with merchants, talking with people on the street. Um, you know, we've done things where they would walk around and just have conversations with any, anyone that would listen um, and demonstrate how Bitrefill works, for example. That's one of their one of their favorite things to do because it's it's a very it's a very the response they get from people is is very positive when when they can show this person that hey, I can actually use this thing and this is how it works and I can use it to buy airtime or put credits for the phone. Um, so it, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say. I mean, those are obviously educational efforts, but it's not. It's, it's sort of more in a practical sense. It's a, it's a practical. They, they're basically just demonstrating to people how to use it in the ways that they've been using it. But they're not, they're not talking about, you know, the block size limit or, um, you know, the, the idea of smart contracts. You know, is it a worthwhile idea to pursue on chain or should it be on second layer? You know, stuff like that. It's not. That's not that's not the kind of education that they that they're focused on. It's it's all about like day to day practical things like how how do I buy airtime with Bitrefill? How do I cash out with Paxful? How do I you know do things you know back up my wallet for example um, things like that. Um, that's that's done. We've got 
we've got one senior coach um, who does most of that. He's, his name is Lutando. Um, he's actually, I would have to credit him with doing most of the, the work on the ground. Um, yeah, I would, it would have been great for him to be here as well. It's tough to get him on the podcast though, because he's busy from nine in the morning until five in the afternoon with the kids uh, most of the time. Um, but yeah, he's, he's the guy doing most of the work on the ground. Um, but Trifle has actually also helped um, the, you guys probably know Steve that runs the local office here in South Africa. Um, he's been very helpful. We we produced a, a little 10-minute Bitcoin explanatory video in Tosa and other African languages like Zulu and Sutu, uh, which, which he helped with. Um, so, yeah. Mm-hmm.